Welcome to the Naughty Child Podcast with me, Richard. And me, Polly. I'm the dad. And I'm the daughter. I did everything before I leave. I need to find that bag on my coins. Alex Hartley took us off air in Brighton earlier this year. I'm a huge fan of Pepper. We thought we were really funny. So Bobby, I'm doing a <laughs> podcast, man. Come on. <laughs> well, my dog is now called Jimmy Anderson. Oh, well, Manchester Originals aren't through to the Eliminators, so I've got to change my team. Uh. Yeah. Do you cook French food? Like, do you cook frog legs and snails? <laughs> oh, I just lock myself in a procedure room. <laughs> Sophie Eccleston's the worst. It's like having a child with you when she's on tour. I don't know whether it shows something about me or whether it just shows something a little bit stupid. Polly, it's great to be back. It is good to be back. Um, we had a little break last week. It was nice to have a week off, but it's very nice to be back. But also we kind of didn't have a week off because the WPL happened and mm-hmm. we we're like, oh, let's do another episode. So we put an episode on YouTube. It's gone viral. Well, yes. Yes and no, I think. You put WPL in the title of it. Well, this, do you know, this is what I realised. And from now on, I think every episode I'm going to put WPL in the title because that gets clicks. Because I noticed with the Catherine Fraser episode on YouTube, I was like... I mean, she's great, but how many fans does she have? I was like, wow. But um, it's because WPL was in that, that title as well. Mm-hmm. So, so lots of people clicked on us thinking, oh, brilliant. I can see some footage. They probably the did WPL think it was footage, actually. And, yeah. And then really disappointed to hear our voices. Yeah, no, I would be too. I'd be really good. Um, anyway, we've got a couple of things to chat about today before we speak to our guest. Mm-hmm. Um, firstly, I want to talk about Edge Baston's Ashes campaign. Um, so Edgebaston slash Warwickshire, or it's kind of Edgebaston, um, published or like launched, that's the word, um, a campaign to try and get people to come to the Ashes. Uh-huh. Um, it was called the Her Story campaign. So they got loads of people to do like a little video. Oh yeah, I saw that. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Now I thought it was quite interesting because a couple of weeks ago I was at Aston Villa um, and... Uh, I think it was half time or even before the game, there was an announcement saying, uh, like, come to Edgebaston for the Ashes this day, blah, blah, blah. And we have spoken about this before, but I thought it was really good how they were targeting an audience who were already coming to a women's sport fixture and were like, well, come to see cricket because the football's not going to be on in England in the summer. So come to the cricket in the summer. And then in this video, they had Hannah Hampton and Alicia Lehman, who both play for Villa, um, as part of the campaign. So I thought it was great kind of connecting the two because that's the people you want to target. It's a key thing, isn't it? Because football is so much bigger than cricket. So yeah. you've got these women's sports fans out there already. Mm. Now, not all of them are going to buy into cricket, but a proportion of mm-hmm. them will. And also yeah. we've got the stars with big, you know, profiles yeah. that are going to draw those people into yeah. um watching the game you know so within the midlands for example mm-hmm. you think villa fans yeah they're likely to want to support sparks because yeah. of busy wong yeah so it's a it's a midlands based person mm. that they can connect with mm. and and want to uh support so i just think yeah it's it's brilliant way of marketing it and needs to be explored more because essentially different sports for women are not rivals with each other no um i think we're all working towards the same goals aren't we yeah yeah definitely um another piece of exciting news or something that happened this week was kim cotton becoming the first female on-field umpire in a full member internationals match it was new zealand against sri lanka um so well done kim cotton yes that's that surprised me because i thought that had already happened but clearly Me too. it hasn't. But <laughs> I saw it and I was like, I feel like this has happened, but it clearly hasn't. I mean, maybe it's that it was not a full member international game. Yeah, I guess I guess I possibly. Mean, but, but yeah, I mean, and yeah, that, that needs to grow, isn't it? Because the gender of the umpire really, really does not matter. It's the no, it's quality the of the decision making. Decision making. <laughs> yeah. So that's some good news. Now, um, we need to chat all about Australia. Because they've oh. two pieces of news, or they've announced their Ashes squad, which feels really early. But at the same time, if, if they are going to travel, then they're, they're not really going to play any cricket between now and then, are they? So exactly. not lots going to change. Yeah, um, and they've also announced their contract list. So in terms of the Ashes squad, quite interesting. We've got Phoebe Litchfield, um, which I'm very excited. Well, as an England fan, I'm not excited about. But in terms of 
seeing players coming through. I think Phoebe is really exciting. I mean, it must be really difficult to break into that Australian team. I know. And there are loads of really good players who yeah. don't get anywhere near it. Mm-hmm. Um, so to be able to break into that team mm-hmm. at this point, I, you know, things look really good for her. It'll yeah. be interesting to see uh, what part she plays and how she mm-hmm. develops over um, the time ahead. I think she's playing fair break at the moment, isn't yeah. she? Yeah. Uh, and scoring quite a lot of runs. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So a, a really exciting up and coming player. Yeah. And um, that squad just looks so strong. It always does, but they've got their A team as well going out. And it's like, their A team could play our first team. Hey, and... <laughs> hey! Listen, defeatist talk about the Ashes is oh, banned. Dear. Okay, <laughs> it's coming home. Oh no, don't. <laughs> um, but anyway, with contracts, quite interesting. So Rachel Haynes obviously retired, so she's not on the contract list. Nicola Carey mm. declined a contract. So originally, I thought, oh, maybe she's doing like DeAndre Dotton and wants to go play all around the world. But from what she was saying, she wants to have a full winter in Tasmania, work on her skills, and then get back into the squad. I was like, you've been given a chance to be like to be contracted. You might not get this again, sort well, of thing. Why would anyone want to spend a full winter in Tasmania? Yeah, very good point. Isn't it the coldest part of Australia? That, that's what I thought. I thought it was just going to be like rain and cold. Um, I mean, I thought it, it was an interesting decision because I don't think I've really see it's very rare for someone to either turn down like a international like a central contract or an international call up um and to go public on it yeah um i was surprised that they did like publicly i suppose it's maybe because if people were like outraged that she didn't i don't know she might have a big fan base yeah um but I, yeah i was quite surprised with that however heather graham grace harris phoebe ditchfield and kim garth have all got central contracts mm. now um, Kim Garth is like the ultimate success story of when you take a massive risk because you think about the amount of people that could, well it's probably not that many but you think about like Kirsty Gordon for example mm-hmm. leaving Scotland to play for England knowing she can't then play for Scotland for I think it's like four years or something mm-hmm. Kim has done probably the hardest one going to Australia and it paid off which is really interesting it it has, but even if it had it not paid off, mm. I think it would have still paid off. Yeah, because of the professionalism. Yeah, that's, yeah, yeah. Um, but still, that I mean, to get contracted by Australia, that is an cool. amazing achievement. Well done, yeah. King Garth. Well done. Um, the final thing, on my like little note that I want to talk about is the MCC honorary life membership. So quite a few English players were given it. So Anya. Mm-hmm. Uh, Jenny Gurn, Laura Marsh, mm-hmm. like a, a couple of people. Um, however, someone who was named as a non-player was the legendary Jane Powell. Now, considering she's a non-player, she's achieved a lot, uh, captaining uh, in a World Cup final. Um, she had a test average of 35.12. Uh, she scored a test century, I think it's 115 not out against India. So... Considering she she wasn't playing at any of this, wow! <laughs> I don't think many non-play members can say they achieved all that. Yes, I I, I guess she's had other roles since retiring, hasn't she? Yeah. Which are non-playing roles, and maybe it's in That's recognition true. of those as well as her distinguished but, career. Yeah, but I think to not recognise the fact that she's played international career and even captained England, I think, was a bit like okay, needs to be um, put right. Absolutely, yes. Now, there's something uh, we also want to talk about. Yeah, Afghanistan. I, yeah. I, I, I'm really puzzled. Mm-hmm. The ICC are currently breaking their own rules. Mm-hmm. Um, because to be a full member, there are 14 full member countries of the ICC. And to be a full member, you must have and be developing women's cricket. Mm-hmm. And since 2021, when the Taliban took over in Afghanistan, women have been banned from participating in sport, from going outside their house without a male relative or their husband with them, uh, from going to school or any sort of education. And um, things are just carried on as if nothing's Mm. changed. And I'm wondering at what point things are going to change. So the 
um, Afghan women's cricket team are currently in exile in mm -hmm. Australia. And ABC in Australia did a really good mm -hmm. uh, news report on this. And um, the Afghan cricket board have been granted £25 million um, pounds, mm. um, by the ICC as their for the for the year to cover mm -hmm. their teams and uh that's all going to the men's team and because they don't even acknowledge they have yeah. a women's team even though the conditions of membership is that they mm. do um and i'm just wondering what the icc are intending to do about it they've they've got this fabled um working group on afghanistan mm. uh, which allegedly meets doesn't report back or <laughs> seem to have any minutes that are published mm -hmm. and it actually does absolutely nothing at all. Mm. And this is really, really worrying. The um, the head of the Afghan cricket board, the ACB, is Mirwais Ashraf. He, mm -hmm. you know, until recently played for Afghanistan. He's only in his mid-30s. And um, he uh, is essentially, he is the Taliban. Mm. And I think that's how we need to see the ACB mm -hmm. is that they are no different from the Taliban. So he has meetings uh, with people like uh, Sirajuddin Haqqani, uh, mm -hmm. who's the interior minister of Afghanistan, is on the FBI's most wanted list for terrorism offences mm -hmm. and is driving this policy of excluding women from all aspects of life mm -hmm. in Afghanistan. If if he is working for him, mm. he is part of that. Yeah. You know, I would suggest that when this horrible um, regime eventually does collapse, mm. that Mirway Sashraf, your name needs to be on that most wanted mm. list as well, because you are completely collaborating with this murderous regime. Yeah. Currently in Afghanistan, malnutrition is mm. horrendous. Seven out of eight children are malnourished currently in Afghanistan. UNICEF are being stopped from working there because they won't allow women who work for UNICEF um, to work there. A disproportionate number of the children being mal malnourished are girls mm. and the women are the people who are also suffering as well. Um, all this information is out there um, on UNICEF's mm. uh, information that they're putting out there. It is a huge worry. Now, let me talk about another sporting organisation, FIFA. Mm -hmm. They are exactly they are doing exactly yeah. what the IOC are doing. Unsurprisingly, uh, the Afghan women's football team are also in exile in Australia, mm -hmm. and FIFA are doing nothing to support them, and are supporting the Afghan men's football team in allowing it to continue um, to exist. So there's a really good article uh, back in January in the Guardian by Malala Yousafzai. Friend of the pod. I know you listen every week, Malala. <laughs> Don't say that. <laughs> and uh, highlighting the football team. Now, mm -hmm. Malala, I know, is a big cricket fan as yeah. well, so it will be equally concerned. Mm -hmm. uh, but FIFA um, and the ICC, I, I mean, they are just so similar. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and are, are doing absolutely nothing about mm -hmm. it, not responding to anything about it at all. Yeah. I don't understand it you know maybe maybe there's something really high level political going on to do with soft power which i don't really mm. understand and someone really important is telling them you know keep afghanistan mm. on board or i i don't know but it just seems utterly bizarre to me yeah can i talk about the ioc the mm. international olympic committee in their meeting in lausanne uh, last december they gave an ultimatum to afghanistan said that said that Afghanistan will be banned from the Paris Olympics if they do not allow girls and women safe access to sport. Mm -hmm. That's the sort of thing yeah. we're looking for from the yeah. ICC. Because that's what the ICC essentially say in their policy. And then when that actually happens, they're not doing anything about it. Yeah. The IOC executive board expressed serious concern and strongly condemned the restrictions on women. Even just say that, yeah. please. You know, even if you don't do anything, can you just say that it's bad yeah. for us? Yeah, I, it would just make me feel like you. We share some of the same mm. values. Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, we kind of wanted to highlight that. Um, other friends of the pod, uh, Raf and Sid on the Cricket Her Weekly, spoke about it a few weeks ago, and talked about this idea of cricket as a human right, um, and kind of started that hashtag. And I think that's really important because, like we like later today we're going to watch cricket 
Mm-hmm. We're just allowed to do that. Mm-hmm. Imagine if someone just said, no, you're not allowed to do that. Or you're not allowed to play it. Later it's... today, we're going to watch cricket. We are. I love that. I do love that. It's been too. too long. I know. Um, and it, yeah, it is, it's a human right because it's the freedom to go and watch sport. And why, why should, you know, why should you be prevented from doing that? And in the grand scheme of things in Afghanistan, actually, sport is a small thing. Yeah. But it is symbolic. It is. The fact that you can't go out of your house. Mm. Uh, so, uh, you know, 50% of the population are under house arrest. Yeah. That you have no right to education. Mm. That healthcare. So the rule in Afghanistan is for a woman to get healthcare, it needs to be from a female doctor. Yeah, but, but you're not allowed to be a doctor. But you can't be a doctor because <laughs> there's oh. no education. Yeah. I mean, it, it's, a, it's a society that is going to completely implode mm. yeah. because of the, the crazy way it, it's being run. Yeah. Um, and we need to speak up on these things. Yeah. Um, does that conclude our chat? Is there anything else you want to say? Um, there was something else, but I've totally forgotten it. Okay. Well, if we remember, we can. I'll say, say it, it at the end. Yeah. Yeah. Save it to yeah. the end. Um. So we do have an interview today. We do. Um. It's someone with real street cred. Oh my gosh. In fact, she plays street cricket. Oh, stop it. And when I say street, I mean street and smurfs that. <laughs> that was <laughs> one of your worst jokes. <laughs> no, not okay. Um, we spoke to Neve Holland, who played for England in 19, mm-hmm. plays for Somerset, of course, mm-hmm. um, and also played for Western Storm, and has just received her first professional contract. So enjoy our chat with Neve. <laughs> Um, so how did you first get into cricket? Um, I would probably say I was watching my brother play at the local cricket club because he was kind of um, playing down there. And I think they were short for one game and I kind of just got involved. And then from there on, it just went on. And then primary school, I had a few, they had some coaches come in, like Chance to Shine, for example, came in. Um, had some sessions I just really enjoyed it and then also my brother was going my dad played a bit of cricket so it all just ran in the family a bit so I just carried on from there really. Did, did you ever have a moment where you were like this is a sport I want to do like this is what I love? Um, I wouldn't say it was especially a moment but I kind of enjoyed all sports throughout kind of growing up I'd play hockey, netball, cricket, football everything and then kind of cricket kind of just took off as I that became more dominant in my sports. So I think, yeah, it kind of, there wasn't a moment, but there was definitely a bit where I thought, this is what I want to focus on. Um, and this is what I'm going to put 100% effort in, kind of. So what's the name of your cricket club, by the way? It's always good to name check the cricket clubs, I, I think, on these podcasts. What, what, uh, what's the um, So I was at Long Sun Cricket Club, but I'm now at Street Cricket Club. It's where I play now with my dad for the social. Right, of course, Street, that's, that's Somerset, isn't it? Yeah, Somerset, yeah. So who were your role models growing up in cricket or did you have any? I probably wouldn't say I had any role models, for example, but I'd say um, growing up, I never really, I didn't really see much of the women's great game when I was growing up because I had obviously a brother and my dad was playing. So all I did was kind of look up to them playing. I was like, oh, I want to play at that level. I want to play with them. Um, and then it just went on from there. So I'd never say I kind of actually looked at the women's game that much, but in the men's game, definitely kind of Ben Stokes. I think the way he plays um, kind of captures a lot of people. So, um, yeah, definitely him, for example. Yeah, I think anyone's mad not to look up to Ben Stokes as a cricketer because he's just kind of the all the all round package, really. Well, he's amazing, isn't he? Because I remember sort of the, well, in fact, it wasn't even this time last year. We were talking about the England men's captaincy, and there was talk about whether Stokes should have it. And I was, I was mm. thinking, I don't. I'm not convinced, you know, he, he, um, yeah, I, I wasn't convinced. I don't know whether he'd cope with it. Often those really, really good players are not very good captains because they just turn up and are brilliant without really knowing how they're doing it. <laughs> yeah, so yeah. It's difficult to inspire other people, but it's been just amazing, hasn't it? I mean, and, and actually it's had a knock on effect um, it, for the women's game as well. So I, I think about how, you played in the under 19s world cup and actually you can see there's a there's a 
there's a kind of DNA thread of basball going into how your approach there and and going on in the in the women's team for England at the moment as well. It's almost like it's become an identity there. Yeah, I definitely say that. Um, take a lot of inspiration from obviously the Test team now. I think people looking at Test cricket now has definitely changed their perspective for sure and the way they play and the success they get I think just tries everyone else to try and play the same really and it's really exciting cricket as well people want to watch that kind of stuff nowadays so yeah exactly and um and at Western Storm you've got some incredible players a lot of senior players who are some of the people in that team that have really kind of helped you on your cricket journey um I'd say Sophie Luff definitely um especially at Somerset as well um she's been a big part in obviously me as a cricketer and a person growing up um she was my first captain when I played for Somerset, I think when I was about 13. And she also coached me before that as well. Um, so I think she's been a big mentor for me going through the age groups and then transitioning from the Storm Academy into the seniors as well. Yeah, I was going to mention that transition. What was it like being kind of a young player going from the academy to the senior team? And, you know, you end up playing against some of the best players in England within, you know, the regional set. What was that like? Probably I didn't actually take it all in. I kind of just threw myself into it. Um, didn't actually think much of it. And then once I was up, out there, I was like, oh my gosh, I'm playing against England players. I could never actually think I'd be bowling at an England player or batting against an England player. Um, but then obviously you find yourself in the, out in the middle and then you have to deal with whatever's coming at you. So I think um, probably just realising it and kind of taking it all in. Um, but I never really had that. I think playing boys cricket when I... I was younger as well, really did help because I never really had that kind of worry of transition. I kind of just threw myself into something, quite a relaxed character as well. So it kind of just helped in that way of just throwing myself into everything. Um, but yeah. Yeah, I mean, we've talked about this on the pod before as well, haven't we, about what a great um, sort of preparation it is uh, to be playing alongside men and boys for your club whilst developing yourself in the women's game as well. And it, and it seems like that really, really aids the transition as you as you go up the age, particularly as as a very, very young player, you end up playing at, um, sort of women's cricket, as you said, from about the age of 13. Yeah, definitely. I think that's one thing that probably stands out for me is playing boys cricket when I was younger. And I loved it all the time. For some girls, it isn't for them. Um, but I was kind of thrown in the deep end. Um, and then obviously I was lucky enough to have my brother in the team as well. So I kind of had um, someone to kind of look up to in that sense. Um, <laughs> not not all sisters would say that about their brothers. So it sounds to me like you've got a very special relationship, right? Yeah, he's all right sometimes. But, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, just kind of grateful that I was being able to play in a team with him as well. Because obviously for some girls, I think that'd be quite daunting going straight into a boys team. <laughs> Yeah, definitely. Um, but another place you really held your own was the Under-19 World Cup. Talk to us about um, the process of being selected for that. You know, where were you when you found out about it all? I was at college when I first found out. So I think it was October time, September, October time. I was just in my class and I remember my mum, she, she sent me a message. She said, oh, is your phone on? I said, oh, yeah, it is on. I'm replying to kind of you. She was like, oh, OK, I'm just checking. And I kind of thought, oh, I don't know what she's kind of on about here. And then about as soon as I got up to leave my classroom, I had a phone call and it was, I thought maybe a scam or something because it was an unknown number. I didn't have a clue. So I picked up and it was Richard Redbrook. And I was kind of in shock because I didn't really know when the selections were going to happen or if we were going to get a phone call. I didn't really know what the process was like. Um, but yeah, I was in college, so I rang my parents straight away. But they actually knew before me because obviously I was under 18 at that time. So my mum was struggling to keep it quiet for a bit. So how did how did they decide? Um, was the, had you been watched a number of times? You know, were there sort of uh, you know people with a, a newspaper mm -hmm. watching various games, sort of peeking over it and seeing you know, how how's Nee playing today and that sort of thing? Uh, how how was it decided who would get in the team? Um, well, I think it was kind of scattered throughout the summer. Um, there were scouts coming to quite a few of the games, I think. And then obviously we had the school games towards the end of the summer in September. I think that probably played a big role in it. I was lucky enough to get a, a good score behind my belt in the first game. I think 
which really helped kind of my cause going into that. But I think it's kind of accumulation of all the games over the summer. And I think they're just watching throughout. And we've spoken to a couple of the members of the Under-19 team um, when you were training. Um, but looking back on those couple of weeks before you actually went to South Africa, what was that like meeting up with a group of people who you don't normally train with at Loughborough, a place you don't normally train, um, and kind of having to fit that around your everyday life? Yeah, it was definitely different. Um, Because I kind of used to training in the week and then the weekends would be more kind of catch up on college work, stuff like that. But I found myself kind of obviously some set to Loughborough is quite fast as about three and a half hour drive. So I was doing that every Friday night, which obviously traffic isn't great at that time. Um, But that was a new experience for me. But um, definitely like meeting all of the other people that you would have played against. Obviously, you always see, oh, they're very good players, such and such. But you never really get to know them on a on a basis like that obviously the school games helps you get to know a few of them two or three in your team but I think us as an environment grew so quickly and I think everyone learned off each other so quickly as well and I think especially those camps leading up to the World Cup really helped us kind of gel as a team together as well. Yeah I mean that's one thing I noticed in particular out of all the teams the England team even on the pitch looked really close because I think it was Australia who they hadn't met up until like a week before the tournament and that has a massive impact when you've never played with these people and suddenly you're playing like age group international cricket at a world cup it's it's quite a big deal um so what was it like when you actually got to South Africa was it because I I was saying this I'd imagine it's a bit like a school trip where you're kind of just with all your mates having a lot of fun but then obviously there's the added element of this is kind of serious this is a world cup yeah definitely I kind of had Obviously, throughout Christmas, we're all very excited about going out there. Um, But I never really had any expectation because, obviously, there's never been an under-19 World Cup before for women. Um, So none of us really knew how it would plan out. Um, But just the excitement was unreal, really. We got out there, kind of, obviously, we're all young, but it was obviously a very serious competition as well. Um, But, yeah, the way I would never have managed imagined how it would plan out I feel like when we got there we actually realized oh my gosh we are playing in a world cup um probably didn't hit us until we actually started playing some warm-up games um but yeah the experience we had over there was something we'll probably never have again I mean just that lining up for the national anthem and that kind of thing it's just like that must be one of those goosebumps moments obviously when we were in the camps before uh the head coach actually made us sing the national anthem in, in an indoor game um and all of us were like, oh, why is he doing this? Kind of as a joke. And then it kind of all hit us. Oh, we're, like we're actually going to be singing the national anthem um, when we're out there. So the first time we sang that was definitely a big moment. And I think everyone then realised how much it kind of meant to everyone to be playing out there in South Africa in a World Cup. And had you played abroad before or was this your first overseas tour? Um, I've been lucky enough to go away with uh, Somerset. I went to Sri Lanka um, last February, which was such a great opportunity and then I think when I was about 15 I went away with school to Barbados to play cricket so I've been really lucky in that sense to be able to go and play but they were kind of more leisure tours <laughs> with some cricket as well um they were really good uh experience obviously playing abroad different conditions and stuff like that but it was nothing compared to obviously the month away we had well yeah. <laughs> Barbados and Sri Lanka <laughs> yeah I'm very lucky that's very That's nice. Really cool. uh, talk to us about the mascot that the team had, because um, we haven't actually spoken to it, any of the players about this, mm-hmm. but um, the little lion, where did the lion come from and why was the lion everywhere? Um, so the lion, so we started our first warm-up games and we all, we have kind of a, we had a debrief after the games as well. And it was kind of, it was for the play of the day. So whoever would get play of the day, um, one of the coaches would pick play of the day each after each game um and there'd be like a reason why they got play of the day etc and then you would have to look after the lion for a day and take it everywhere and get it home safe i mean some of the girls were questionable about that um but it was entertaining and then it, it just came around everywhere with us um it managed to get its own accreditation at the end um but yeah Everyone's, it was a good laugh having it around and it was a good way to kind of show everyone's play of the day and get everyone involved, really. I mean, surely that's a bit of a burden for doing well. Like, you would want to play badly. You don't have to look after the lion. Did you Did you have to look after the lion at any point? Maybe after the Zimbabwe game? Yeah, after the Zimbabwe game, I had to look after it. And it's, it's quite hard, actually, 
So that is quite uh, a, uh, I wouldn't say it was a chore, but it was like, oh, I've got to think about the lion as well. Wherever I go, it's got to come with me. Um, but one of the girls tried to give it a bath in the swimming pool, and I don't think that ended too well, but um, it's still alive, so... That's good. <laughs> I mean, it, it just seems to me that you had such an amazing time and that, that there have been friendships built um, across that, I suppose, the build-up and then the tournament, which is just going to last for the rest of your life. Yeah, definitely. Um, probably going into it, we never really thought we'd make friendships that we did when we were out there. Um, but the way the team gelled so quickly was something we all of us probably didn't think would ever happen, neither of the coaches. I think everyone was quite shocked about how everyone got along. Um, and how of a team environment it was. Um, but yes, definitely made friends for life out there. And, you know, we've said this a couple of times, but it's so exciting to think that, you know, this is the generation of players that are going to be around for the next 10, 15 years, and you're going to be constantly playing against each other and potentially with each other for, for that time as well. Yeah, I think when we obviously get outside, it could be quite weird playing against each other. Um, but obviously playing against each other in the the past years um was obviously good because you can you understand other people's strengths as well um so we could either pick on that when we were playing together um but yeah it'd be definitely weird to go against playing against each other after getting to know everyone so well now um the other week we spoke to Amy Smith who played for Australia under 19 and obviously that was an extremely close game and we'll get onto that in a minute but she spoke about England's sledging, specifically Seren Smell, but in general, the team as a whole, and how that actually put them off with Seren going in, like, saying the players here, you know, you've got no plan, you've only got one shot. Was sledging a, a part of the kind of team environment and the the ethics of the game, <laughs> so to speak? I don't think we ever spoke about it, really, to be honest. Um I never actually heard any of it until we were watching our highlights back and we heard it on the thing because I was actually filming on the boundary. So I didn't really hear much, much of it. Um, but we never really spoke about it. But I guess in those tight games, you've got to do what you've got to do, I guess. Well, it, it, I mean, it clearly worked. And and for Amy to say it was getting in their heads, I was like, for the Aussie to admit that the English were getting in their yeah, heads. Yeah, exactly. Was, that was excellent. I was impressed by that. Yeah, it, it all looks good for the future, really, doesn't it? <laughs> you know, we've we've got one up on them already. Um, and uh, again, you think of these generation of players as they play each other. I uh, I look forward to uh, to this generation of players bringing several Ashes urns mm -hmm. back. Yeah, definitely. I think it's kind of obviously the sledding was definitely probably not in our plan. But I think sometimes we did say to ourselves, we are a bit too nice when we're out there. I think we need to have something a bit about us. Um, obviously, in a tight game like that, everything does come out. I mean, how nervous were you in that semi-final? Because it was like, it was painful to watch. It, it was terrifying. But obviously, ended, it ended really well. So um, it was it was a good watch in the end. Yeah, I'd probably say, um, obviously, before the game, I was more nervous than actually at the halfway stage because... Well, it was weird because after I spoke to everyone, we all actually said we did have to think. Obviously, we didn't put much on the board when we got to the um, middle of the innings, but we kind of said to everyone, like, we're still in this. Like, obviously, Australia hadn't... Um, they are kind of more of a bowling unit, um, so we knew they would have a good bowling side, but we said they hadn't hit loads and loads of runs throughout the tournament. Um, and I feel like everyone kind of just had this sense, obviously, when we had the huddle... Um, in the middle, we all kind of just had this sense of, oh, we can actually do this. It's going to be difficult, but we can actually do this. And I think when we were out there, obviously, when they needed four to win, we needed one wicket. Um, and I was at kind of cow corner. I did think this could come to me, considering there is a lower order batter. Um, but it was more excitement, really, because obviously, if you get that opportunity, it's such a great thing to have. Um, but yeah, it was much relief for sure when we got that last wicket. And what was Grace Scrivens' impact on the team as a captain? Because from what we could see, she was such a like mature captain, knew what she was doing and just led the team really, really well and kept everyone super calm. Yeah, I think her calmness kind of rubs off on everyone else. Um, she knows everyone's strengths as well. She gets along with everyone well. Um, I think she knows how to deal with people in all those situations. Um, and I feel like everyone could believe that she believed we could we could definitely beat them in that, even at the halftime stage, obviously. It wasn't looking the, the best for us. Um, but when we heard her, um, obviously, give her a little talk in the middle, we were all like, actually, we can do this. Like, we are playing 
in a World Cup semi-final. Like, we're here for a reason. Um, and I think that definitely rubbed off on everyone. And the way she led the team throughout the tournament was very special. And obviously, the way she played throughout the tournament was outstanding as well. And tell me a little bit about the final, because we, we love to talk about the semi-final. We like less to talk about the final. But I, I'm just wondering what your reflections are now, you know, several weeks after the event. Um, what are your thoughts on on the final and what all happened there? So how did the coaches help you, I suppose, afterwards to manage those emotions after having such a big disappointment in the final? Yeah, I think it's just putting it into perspective. Obviously, like the run we had throughout the whole tournament and the way that we all played with no regret when we were out there, we obviously took the positive option most of the times. So that was one of our sayings. Obviously, if you're ever in doubt, take the positive option. Um because then we all thought we can we won't regret any decision that we make then because it's always going to be positive um and ultimately we got beat by a better team on the day um but the, the coaches helped a lot considering obviously it was quite a harsh loss loss in the end um but it was kind of just putting everything in perspective and seeing we've just played in a world cup not many people get that opportunity so to be grateful to even play in a world cup let alone a final is something we'll always be grateful for so almost the Obviously, the result mattered a lot, but in the end, it was good to even get that far. Yeah, you you still got a medal out of it, so um, it wasn't quite gold, but <laughs> still got a medal. Um, what was it like having the England girls watching? Because they had just arrived in South Africa and came over to watch. Yeah, it was quite a cool experience. Um, I didn't actually know they were coming to watch until the day that was the final, and the script was like oh the, the England girls are coming obviously Tash Frank was in the group for um, a while so got to know her which was really good she was a great role model for everyone throughout um, and I don't really think there was any added pressure we were just grateful for all the support that was obviously there um, it's obviously new to them as well they've never watched under 19 World Cup before um, but it's great to have that support because we felt that was the support when we were out there and obviously the support Support from back home was so great as well. Yeah, we really enjoyed watching all the parents out there. Did you have family members that come out, came out to watch? Yeah, my family came out. They loved it. They're, obviously, the um, England fans are definitely loving it when they're out there. All the family was getting really involved. Yeah, I specifically think of Josie Groves' mum <laughs> dancing, which was just excellent. I think, to be fair, I think the cameras focused more on her than the cricket at some point. At times, yeah. At, at times. times, it was quite good. <laughs> yeah, the cameras were definitely loving that. Um, so then it's just, well, relatively recently been announced that you have signed a professional contract with Western Storm. What is that like to now be a professional cricketer, age 18? Yeah, I think it's something that I probably never even thought would happen. Um, because obviously when I was growing up, there wasn't, um, a way where you could be a professional without playing for England. Um, and it's all, when I kind of sit down and think about it, I think I never really think this could actually happen. But um, being full time now and college is quite hard at the moment. Um, but once I get the college out of the way and being able to focus on the cricket, it will definitely be a lot easier. But being able to do something I enjoy for my job, not a lot of people have that yeah. opportunity. So I think I'm just grateful that I can do something I can enjoy mm -hmm. for a living. That's amazing, isn't it? Because I, um, I, I guess all your contemporaries at college there, thinking of what they're going to go on to do next, whether they're going to go to university or looking for a job and that sort of thing. And you're kind of all sorted out. Yeah, a lot of them do say that sometimes, but I kind of have to remind them that it's obviously not a long career. So um, anything can happen. So I kind of want to try and get as much um, qualifications behind me as possible, just in case for any eventuality. Yeah, I think that's wise, isn't it? And I guess if you look at any underage England side in any sport, um, in any given year and and then sort of track what happens to that group of people over over time there's a proportion that that go on and become solid pros there's a small number who become brilliant internationals and then there's also a number who kind of for whatever reason don't continue in the sport so I think you've got to I think you're wise to kind of keep your options open in that sense um and we had the 100 draft last week and now it's an open market so anyone can go anywhere so what are your hopes with getting picked up for the 100 i bet your phone has been buzzing <laughs> hasn't it <laughs> yeah i can't say um yeah, but yeah. No, no you can tell us we won't tell anyone it's fine <laughs> um but yeah definitely i'm um really excited i obviously want to be part of the 100 this year i think the way it is for women's cricket is great like the way it's the trajectory that women's cricket is going on and the 100 is helping that so much and this kind of the style that I play is something that I want to be able to put into the 100 the way I want to play positively is something that the 100 is all about um 
So I think probably just to have that opportunity in the 100 would be great to be able to obviously play and train with overseas players and international players, even just to learn off them and different coaches um, would be a great experience. Definitely something I'd benefit from, I think. Yeah, Hannah Baker, £18,000 contract. What's, <laughs> what's going on there? Yeah, I love that. It just shows the kind of the platform that um, the under-19s has helped. Um, she's obviously very capable of that and it's great to see that. But like the platform that's been put on for her um, is great. Um, but yeah, that's just so cool. She can even be picked up for that. It's just mad, really. It was crazy because I think for the first two years, she was on like the lowest bracket. And now like to get picked up in the draft is is mega because there are so many like top players that have not been picked up in the draft so I was like well, yeah, yeah and you look at the other people who are on 18 grand or the people who are below are on 15 grand yeah. Think, Whoa, that's... <laughs> yeah to be in, in that bracket she must feel quite good yeah. but as, as you say the under 19 world cup kind of have, have put all of you on a platform and people recognize you now um as you know the, the first ever under 19 squad so I mean going into the season does that give you a lot of confidence that you know people have started to recognize these young players coming through yeah definitely it gives me a lot of confidence obviously going into the um storm side definitely I think I kind of know that I can perform at that level as well um which is good it kind of gives you confidence when you go out in the middle because you can draw on the experiences you've had kind of in South Africa as well um just to kind of boost your confidence when you're out there. So you must have some you must have some uh, games coming up soon. In fact, Polly's been down Edge but Polly truanted school this afternoon and went down <laughs> to Edge Boston, uh, where oh, no. Warwickshire men were playing Worcestershire men. And uh, and I think this weekend we got because we're Birmingham based and um, you've got Central Sparks yeah. have got a little warm up game, haven't they? So have you got similar things happening in the next uh, couple of weeks? Yeah, so we've actually got a pre-season kind of um, tour at, at Milford School where all of um, the Western Storm and the Academy were playing um, a few games down there, all different formats. I think we're playing a two-day game as well, which will be quite cool um, to get time out in the middle um, and for bowlers to get, obviously, bowling workloads under their belts. But, um, yeah, I think it'll be good for the whole squad to spend some time together when we're down there. <laughs> very exciting it feels like this season is right around the corner now I know the clocks so have sweet. changed and <laughs> suddenly yeah yeah definitely when it's a lot lighter outside it definitely feels like it's coming towards the summer now well that's that's brilliant we want to wish you all the best for this season we'll be definitely watching out for you mm -hmm. we might get to see Western Storm play at some point Probably. I dare say yeah and uh and whichever franchise you end up with in the hundred <laughs> we'll we, we may end up seeing them play as well um, but we want to wish you all the best for this season and uh, and hope your, your progress just continues the way it's been going. Thank you very much for having me on. That was amazing. Mm -hmm. Hey, Polly, we're going to watch cricket this afternoon. We're going to go watch some cricket it's, and the sun is shining. It's Good Friday. The sun is shining. And yeah, there's a there's a game. It's just a friendly, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Just a friendly. It's never a friendly. <laughs> uh, so Central Sparks having a little warm up game against South East Stars. I yeah. Think. Yeah. 50 over, I think. So we'll run down there, see if Izzy's there, Capsie's there. Oh, yeah. Well, I don't know who's going to be. I don't know who's in the squads. I don't really know anything about it. All I know is that it starts at 10.30 and it's 12 minutes past. No, but... <laughs> It's already 1042, started. yeah. It's already started. Um, so we're looking for, and it's just, mm -hmm. I can feel it stretching out ahead of me. Yeah. Can you feel that? <laughs> the whole season, six months. We've had six months of nothing since Lords. I know. And now it's all stretching out ahead of us. It's so exciting. It's really good. Yeah. And for the weather to actually be good, mm. that's a miracle. I do feel a bit tired, though. I'm knackered. We went out yesterday. <laughs> had a mad night out. <laughs> had a mad night out. Mad night out in, in London. London. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we went to Wembley and um, my that's why my voice is actually a bit... Mm. Yeah. Well, we had a whole day in London. So, so we left the house at seven o'clock yesterday yeah. morning and got back at two o'clock this morning. We're just crazy. <laughs> <laughs> Life in the fast lane. I know. But that's... I get so excited when I see 83,000 at Wembley because I, I think this could be cricket as well. Do you know, I was thinking this because we were with a friend of the pod, Lily, um, who obviously was at the MCG for the Women's World Cup final mm -hmm. back in 2020. And she's just like, that was the best atmosphere. Like there were 
you know, almost uh, like 83,000 people around that um, for that final. Um, and it's just like that, yeah, that could be cricket. Well, we don't have a stadium to actually contain yeah. it. But, but I mean, in Australia, yeah. <laughs> but um, over, the, well, I guess when you think about it, you think about a five day test match, mm. you could get 100,000 people watching yeah. a five day test match yeah. over the five days. Yeah. Um, so it, it could happen. Yeah. But to think that that many people would be interested mm. in like women's cricket would be pretty cool. Um, but yeah, oh, what a game. I'm knackered. Um, so luckily we've got quite a chill day today and we're off to Northumberland we are off to the land of Lizzie Scott oh I'm so looking forward I'm to it I'm so excited that's been my motivation all year so mm. it'll be very nice to go and just relax unfortunately mm-hmm. so the county stuff is starting next week and um, Northumberland are playing in well North East Warriors are playing in Northum- Northumberland the day after we leave oh just gonna miss it. So good, but it's all right. We can play some beach cricket and oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So it'll be good. That'll be good, and we'll back next week with a guest. Ow! I just hit my knee. <laughs> just a friendly tap. We'll back next week with a guest. <laughs> Stop it! We are back next week with a guest. Um, should we give any clues? I can't remember who it is. Oh. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> right, I'll blame it on the time. So that was very rude of you. Um, we will be back, back next week with a mysterious guest who we announce. Um, but in the meantime, enjoy the cricket and enjoy the sun and have a lovely Easter. <laughs>